When David Parkin began his playing career at Hawthorne, he did so under the legendary John Kennedy, high school principal and a coach of the highest principals. Kennedy instilled in David a belief in preparation, which resulted in a powerful work ethic that he has carried with him to this very day, both on and off the field. On the field, it led to 211 VFL matches and five games for Victoria. After winning the Hawks' best and fairest in 1965, David led the team from 1969 until 1973, holding aloft the Premiership Cup in 1971. Having learned much of his football under John Kennedy and as a devout disciple of his mentor's theories, it was a natural progression for David to take over as coach of the Hawks in 1977. Just one year later, he took the side to a premiership, beating North Melbourne by 18 points. After four years at Hawthorne, it was time to sample life outside the Hawks nest. Carlton beckoned. It was a union that struck immediate success with flags in 1981 and 1982. Four years later, Fitzroy was the next port of call and even more finals football. His time at Fitzroy ended in 1988 and a two-year sabbatical followed before a return to Carlton in 1991. By 1995, David had moulded his side into a feared unit that was never in doubt of winning the flag, his fourth as coach. When his career ended in the year 2000 and after 21 years and 518 games as a coach, you might have thought he'd retire, but no. He's continued to be a great contributor to the community, particularly as an educator. He has been recognised by Deakin University with an honorary doctorate. For more than 30 years, David has not just taught, but inspired undergraduate sport, coaching students at Deakin University. He has written research papers and books on coaching and leadership. In 2013, Deakin University further recognised David Parkin's contribution to education, to football and the Australian community by establishing the David Parkin Oration for Sport and Social Change. Good evening and welcome to the 2017 Deakin University David Parkin Oration for Sport and Social Change. It's great to see so many here tonight and particularly given the circumstances around the transportation. I begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land that we are gathered on here tonight um, and elders past, present and future. It is my pleasure to also officially welcome the Deakin University's Chancellor, Mr John Stanhope AO, Deakin University Vice-Chancellor Professor Jane Den Hollander AO, fellow council members, members of the executive, distinguished guests, colleagues, friends of Deakin, and anyone else that I haven't mentioned in those categories. I also extend a very warm welcome to our many viewers who are participating in tonight's oration via the live stream that is running by the Deakin University platform. I hope we're coming through loud and clear. The David Parkin oration is an important moment on the Deakin calendar where we stop to think about the contribution that sport makes to our society and celebrate individuals whose work in the arena through deeds or words has had profound impact. Through the lens of history, we are fast approaching the 50-year anniversary of the 1968 Summer Olympic Games, where American athletes Tommy Smith and John Carlos famously presented their black fist salute on the podium of the 200-metre sprint. This most powerful of images is symbolic of the power that athletes have to engage social political agendas. In his autobiography titled Silent Gesture, Smith later explained that rather than a focus on black power, the gesture was meant as a signal to the world for a need for greater focus on human rights suffering and institutional disparities between black and white and rich and poor. Long before that moment, and in the growing media panoptic since it, the actions and words and commitments of sport participants across the globe have continued to attract public attention. Not free from contra contradiction, 
since we met this time last year, we have seen a number of targeted campaigns by athletes and sporting bodies to deliver social messages. In the US, athletes recently came together to protest the Trump administration's targeted travel bans against citizens from particular Muslim countries. Prior to that, we saw a number of prominent UK athletes stand up against the Brexit movement on the grounds that sport is about breaking down barriers, not building them up. More locally, the release of the AFL's campaign for marriage equality has provided another prong in its ongoing mission to play an active civic role in facilitating a more tolerant and diverse Australia. Of course, all that glitters is not gold, but while the contributions of Margaret Court, Bernard Tomic, and those who have been following the local agenda, Ali Fahar, are clearly not always positive, they do provide platforms for wider public discussion and scrutiny from which good can often emerge. Is it, it is against this backdrop that I welcome our guests of honour here this evening, Dr David Parkin, OEM, and tonight's orator, Dr Rick Charlesworth, AO. Tonight, on your behalf, I welcome Rick as our fifth annual David Parkin orator. As we commence proceedings, our social media team are encouraging you to tweet a, a message or two throughout the evening using the official hashtag at Oration, shown on the screen behind me, I think. This invitation is extended to viewers online as well. To provide further context to this year's oration, I welcome to the stage a great supporter of this event, the Vice Chancellor of Deakin University, Professor Jane Den Hollander. Thank you. I begin by acknowledging the Wurundjeri people, the traditional owners of this land on which we are meeting, and I pay my respects to Elders past, present and future, and I particularly welcome and acknowledge any Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander who is with us here, and I thank them. I, expend, I On behalf of my Chancellor, Mr John Stanhope, we acknowledge the following. Mr David Morgan Ayo, previous Chancellor of Deakin University, Dr. David Parkin, OAM, staff member, friend, critic, and mentor. Council members, Deacon staff, Deacon students, guests one and all, and most particularly our speaker tonight, Dr. Rick Charlesworth, AO. It's a delight to welcome you all again to the 2017 Parkin Oration. Um, this is our fifth year. It has become established in our, in our calendar of great events about the community, comment on the community in which we live, and it's a delight to see a full house once again, and we thank you all for coming. The David Parker Narration for Sport and Social Change was established by Deakins University Council in 2012 as a public lecture to be delivered annually by an eminent person within the industry. The Parker Narration gives us the opportunity to explore the challenges and the opportunities for sport as a driver of social change, so eloquently um, explained by our chair of the board, Chris Hickey. The reasonable question, given all the issues in the world as to why we should do this, is useful. At Deakin, we know the important role sport plays in education and ensuring our lives are balanced and healthy. Sport is a universal language that engages people and brings them together in a way few other activities can manage. More than that, Deakin is turning its passion for sport into world-shaping ideas and actions. Our courses and research in sport have global recognition, and if you would indulge me for one moment, it behoves me just to let you know just how good we've done that. And I do so because a very prominent member of the, Austra of the Victorian community said I wasn't paying enough attention to our excellence. Our School of Exercise and Nutrition, guess one and all, was ranked first in the world in the recent Times Higher Education Global Ranking for Sports Science Schools. First in the world is something to think about as it is a rare accolade. And to the people in the audience from Exercise, Nutrition and Sports Science at Deakin, I say bravo. Our past post... <laughs> a 
Alongside that, our postgraduate sport management program is the first and only program of its type in Australia to be ranked internationally and has done that consistently in the top five or six in the United States for some time. And our Bachelor of Sport Development is the first of its kind in Australia. Alongside that, the other thing that Deakin is proud of, and I do so particularly in my current role, is to see women's sport coming into the spotlight. Our women in sport and exercise collaboration, WISE as we call it, involves sporting experts from across the sporting sector, and we have three elite sporting partnerships through the Geelong Cats and their women's VFL team, the Deakin University Elite Women's Race as part of the Cadell Evans Great Ocean Road Race, which we um, launched um, yesterday for the next two years. And what was interesting about that, if I might say, in the wider community is that Deakin is the sponsor of that race in the first year because no one else was interested. Now that it's an elite race, we're competing with everyone for that sponsorship. But the great thing is that women's sport is starting to get the recognition that it needs. And we take great pride for our role in doing that. And of course, our final sponsorship is the, um, the Melbourne Boomers, Deakin Melbourne Boomers as they are known, the basketball players, many of whom are elite sports people and of course Deakin University students. And we take great pride in what we're doing for women's sport at the ground into the elite level. But tonight we are particularly proud to lay claim to David Parkin as one of our own. David Parkin is resound, renowned for the development of Deakin's successful sport coaching course, the first of its kind in Australia. He was, an, he was awarded an honorary doctorate by the university in 2013 for his contribution in the fields of coaching and athlete education and his special contribution in the Australian Football League and the wider coaching community. He is loved across the country, mostly. In establishing, this oration, in establishing this oration, Deacon is honouring David Parkin's very significant contribution to sport and to our society more broadly, in leadership, in sport and in education. He is a football legend. He is a great advocate for leadership. As a sports industry mentor, he has taken his sporting leadership skills into business and to everyday life, and he has shared those skills generously. He is a great friend to Deacon. He has been part of us for a, for a very long time. I am delighted on behalf of you all to introduce all-round legend, part of the Deacon family, Dr. David Parkin, OAM. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Chris and Jane, for your uh, extremely kind remarks. I have lived a very privileged life in my nearly uh, 75 years. Chose my parents well, received a uh, very good education, have remained reasonably healthy, lived in Australia, and have been employed by Deakin University for the past 40 plus years teaching teachers to teach and coaches to coach. This university has also provided me with a couple of personal embarrassments. Back in 2013, I was awarded an honorary doctorate by, doctorate by Deakin at a graduation ceremony in Geelong. I did not tell anyone, including my family. They all know I'm not an academic, that I'm a practitioner, so I don't think it would have gone over well. The day after, I had a phone call from my older brother, Des, who happens to be a medical doctor, and the academic of the family asking me if it was true. He'd been out playing golf with one of his mates whose daughter happened to graduate with me in health sciences. He said, uh, is that true? They gave you a, a doctorate? I told him of my embarrassment, and the response was, you're embarrassed. I just devalued my qualification. The second, quite obviously, is this oration named after me for my contribution to Australian society in leadership, sport and education. I'm very thankful, Jane, that the uh, university would see fit to do this. Sport does command the power to cross barriers. 
to change attitudes, to create communities and even unite nations in a very positive manner. But this power to support the greater good is no easy process. I have now lived through more than five decades of VFL, AFL football as a player, as a coach, as an administrator and now just hanging on as a media commentator. A period of time in which a quiet evolution in our game has become a raging revolution in terms of change, in to both on and off the field. What was once, I think when I started, a reasonably well paid recreational pursuit is now a billion dollar business. Parallel changes in society's thinking during this period have been significant too. Sports of all types have been central to influencing attitudes with regard to racial discrimination, violence against women, illicit and performance enhancing drugs, homophobia, work-life balance. And I guess in the last couple of weeks, the um, mental problems that we've had or players have been able to come out and, and state clearly and confidently their problems in dealing mentally with the issues. I think our sport is one that has at least worked hard in that area. An equal opportunity to name just a few. There is obviously much more to be done in society generally and with our sporting fraternities specifically as the events of the past years, months, and as I suggested, the last few weeks continually remind us. Sport in Australia, which captivates the hearts and minds of both sexes across all ages and within all socio and economic groups, has a massive and very powerful role in changing attitudes to a host of important issues. There has been a limitation of sharing intellectual property within Australian football at elite levels, us being an Indigenous game. But the coaching relationships have been exceptional in my case, in this country, across sports. I was fortunate to have a number of mentors during my 25 years of AFL coaching who shared their, who shared their time and expertise so willingly. The first was Joyce Brown, who coached the Australian netball team to three world championships. Interestingly enough, I coached her son Fraser at Carlton it wasn't easy, and shared an office with her at Deakin, which is even more difficult. <laughs> the second was Brian Gorgian, who's the most successful coach in Australian basketball history, having claimed six National League championships. Rick's contribution to Australian life and culture is second to none. He has served his country as a medical practitioner, as a politician, a Sheffield Shield cricketer, and an international hockey player and coach. As an Australian hockey coach of both the women who dominated world competition between 1993 and 2000, and the men who also led the world from 2009 to 2014, he has been recognised with more awards than time permits me to read out. I did print them off, Rick, but I, there were 16 or 17 and I thought, well, that might be over the top. We became good friends and colleagues during the 90s when we shared the coaching IP related to our two invasion games, Australian football and field hockey. I even had the pleasure of writing the forward to his book, The Coach Managing for Success. It is my absolute pleasure to welcome Dr Rick Charlesworth, AO, to deliver this year's or or oration, The Pursuit of Excellence and the Importance of Culture. Would you welcome Rick, please? Thank you, uh, thank you very much, uh, David. And um, I noticed that you have to go down the little steps there, um, so I, uh, I've given you some time to get back to your seat. David, of course, is a decade older than me, and um, showing it, perhaps. <clears throat> oh, I suffer from dieback. <coughs> 
I, uh, David, of course, played footy for a decade, and I, uh, as an enthusiast of Australian football, watched him during that time. And uh, he was, of course, for a long time, a coaching colleague of mine. He coached for two and a half decades, and interestingly, in the introduction, David, at the start, they didn't mention your stint at Subiaco in 1975, in the year in which the great Cardinals won the premiership. Um, but I think it was a modest year at Subi, wasn't it, back then? You went on to great things at Hawthorne and continued, of course, after that. We first met in the early 90s when uh, I was a new coach at national coaching conferences around the country. And uh, David was always very generous with his ideas and his experience. And a decade later, he very generously agreed to write uh, the foreword for my book. I think that uh, our, inter our contact uh, over the years has been intermittent, but always valuable. And uh, it is very true to say that uh, David Parkin has been a lifelong learner and teacher, and uh, for the contribution you, you've made to my career, I'm very grateful. I'm going to uh, speak today um, about my coaching experience, if you like, but uh, of course, grand things are said about sport and the contribution it might make to our society, and uh, I was reminded when I was thinking about what I would say today about a time when uh, uh, I was an athlete in 1984 at the Olympic Games in Los Angeles. And uh, it's been said that sport helps to uh, bring nations together. And I remember standing in the center of the stadium in Los Angeles and Peter Overath, who was the president of the organizing committee of that, uh, of that uh, Olympic Games, made the statement that before you stands the best hope for the future of mankind. And I looked around and there was a bunch of pugilists and uh, jumpers and shot putters and javelin throwers and I thought, my God, where are we going? <laughs> I might say I should share with you another experience which uh, you might find entertaining, which would occurred in those Olympic Games, 1984. And during the tournament, if you want to be successful and get to the main games at the end, you have to win critical matches during the tournament. We were playing on this day against Germany. I was getting to the end of my career at that time, but I was a significant player in the team, and unfortunately, the German coach decided that I was gonna have a tag that day, much in the manner you see in Australian rules football. And the guy who was chosen to be my tagger was a fellow called Volker Fried. Volker Fried would later become the captain of the German team, he was a very good player, but in 1984, he was a young Tyro in the group, very fit and fast, unfortunately. And uh, his job that day was basically to cut me out. I, uh, I spent uh, the first 20 minutes of the game trying to escape, and I managed to escape from, from uh, Volker. And I was running down the field with the ball. And Volker was very enthusiastic and very disciplined, as the Germans tend to be. And uh, he ran after me and he dived and grabbed me by the leg, which is very good in footy or rugby. Works quite well. It doesn't work so well in hockey. And the umpire at the time was a... English fellow, and he rushed over, blew his whistle very loudly, and he showed Volker the yellow card. The yellow card, of course, means um, temporary suspension in our sport. And uh, there was a bit of tension at the time, as you can imagine, everybody was milling around. Germans were very cunning. They used to pretend they didn't speak English unless they really needed it. The captain of the German team, a guy called Carsten Fischer, decided this was the time to bring out his English. And he ran up close to the umpire. There was, there was a, as I said, there, there was a bit of a melee in the middle of the pitch. And he, he said to the umpire, you can't send him out. He's fighting for the fatherland. <laughs> Which didn't ease the tension much. <clears throat> and I, here, this is the context of how sport brings people together, of course. We had in our team a, a very laconic guy from Queensland at the time, a guy called Trevor King. Trevor didn't know the names of any of the German players, he just used to call them all Fritz. <laughs> and he sidled up to uh, Carsten and he said, hang on Fritz, some of us are fighting for Queensland. 
which was exactly the right thing to do. Unfortunately, uh, that eased the tension a bit, but then Trevor didn't know when to stop, and he said, by the end of the game, Fritz, you'll be wishing you'd been on the Russian front with your dad. <laughs> I make that point to say that sometimes uh, we don't uh, always uh, um, get out of sport uh, the, the, uh, the, the bringing together that we might. Now, unfortunately, I don't have a screen to look at, but I'm going to show you now a video which I think might, uh, might uh, give you an example of the sort of thing that sport can do. Um, what's the score? A touch to play in oh, Orchard. no, no. I didn't do that. What's the score? Zero, zero. And uh, this is the World League final in Antwerp. Um, number one in the world versus number four, Belgium versus Australia. This occurred in July 2015, about the time that Wimbledon was on, and in a week in which Nick Kyrgios went nuts at Wimbledon. What did Nick Kyrgios do? Can anybody remember? He misbehaved, turned his back, didn't play the returns, argued with the umpire, and the story in our media, which you know, I, I do have some criticism of, all week was about how terrible, what terrible sportsmen Australians were. So this is a tense situation. There's three minutes to play. The score's nil all. It's the final of the World League Championship. There's qualification for the World Cup at, at stake here. So there's an edge to the game. Little touch to play in Orchard. Kavanagh. Swan now. Steven stepped up into that right pocket. Swan spotted a gap. Goes on the tomahawk. And there's the cross in. Orchard's going to have a chance here outside the post. Oh, open goal and they score. Kieran Govers scores, but automatically the Belgian team have run away to Ragu Prasad to ask for the video referral. I'll go for your foot. Your foot. Oh, thanks, Kieran. Well, Kieran Govers has just admitted that he kicked it. What an unbelievable bit of sportsmanship. He stuck his hand and said, you know what, I kicked this. Before it goes into the, into the D, it's come off a body. He's already said, before it goes in, that there's a foot. That's exceptional sportsmanship at this level of competition the question that I ask uh, when I speak to audiences and this isn't really an interactive environment is why would you do that and usually there's some smart aleck in the audience who says well the video referral would have revealed it anyway and uh, so you know that's that's why they did it sometimes people will say well it's the right thing to do it's the sporting correct thing to do it's a John Landy moment, perhaps. Um, some will say, well, you, you did it because you wanted to avoid the distraction of a couple of minutes of fiddling around with a video referral and then you, you would have had to get on with it anyway. What I would say is that in all of the teams that I coached, one of the principles that we had that we held very firmly was that you never, never, never cheat. And we had that principle not because it was the right thing to do, but of course it obviously is the right thing to do, but because we wanted to set for ourselves a standard that nobody else had, a standard that was higher than the others. There were no shortcuts, there was no pathway to excellence, and indeed today I'm going to talk about what I think are the things that you need to do to achieve that. This, if you like, is an example of uh, the intersection of uh, culture and the pursuit of excellence. It doesn't happen in every sport, Last year in the Copa America, Raul Ruiz Diaz, who, uh, who was known as the Peruvian Messi, uh, knocked the ball in with his hand to eliminate Brazil from uh, the Copa America, most important tournament in that continent. The interesting thing for me was that two months later than this occurred, one of the Kookaburra players in a club semi-final in Perth did exactly the same thing. He, uh, he put up his hand and said, it's not a goal. There was no video referral that day. There was no other option. There was no possibility of the umpire changing his decision except that he said that uh, a breach had occurred and it wasn't a goal. And uh, his team eventually lost the game. It was a semi-final. It was critical in the club competition. The interesting thing for me was that within 30 minutes of it happening, my sons, who are avid hockey players and follow the game, knew about it, had seen it, and uh, understood why it occurred. I think that uh, it's important that we understand that's why the AFL needs to be very, very hard on the silly, silly 
jumper punching that goes on, the macho carry-on that goes on there, the head-high tackles, the sledging and the racist slurs that occur sometimes in our games, the gratuitous violence, and indeed things like Essendon's very silly program of uh, performance enhancing. It was, it was wrong and silly because uh, the efficacy of the substances they were using wasn't proved. That was bad enough, but the most important thing was the philosophical message that it was sending. The philosophical message that it was sending to the players was that there's a shortcut to excellence, that uh, these uh, substances could make a difference to your performance without the grinding hard work that is really essential if you want to be good. It's also why Sport Auto rail itself against uh, alcohol and gambling, illicit drug use and fast food and all of those things which are pernicious and pushed in our society. I was at the vanguard of, a, of an approach in the 70s to uh, rule out tobacco. Lots of forces in the tobacco industry tried to cast doubt on uh, what we were trying to do. They obfuscated and delayed and tried to spoil our efforts. Thankfully, uh, um, over time, reason has been successful. I wanted to make one other comment before I moved on to uh, my approach to coaching. I had the occasion just two days ago to have a meeting with Jared Neesham. Jared Neesham, as you would know, runs the uh, football um, academy at Clontarf with the uh, aim to make Indigenous players more likely to continue through schooling. It's been immensely successful and uh, provides, I think, a very good example of what sport can do to uh, make a difference. And I thought I might read here, this is, the, this is from the principal of Broome Senior High School. And it's written to Jared, and it's just a little piece from a letter. The whole school has benefited from the involvement of the Clontarf Foundation as shown in our upper school population growing from around 100 in 2005 to 200 in 2010. As more boys continue into year 11 and engage in their education, they seem to drag the girls and others along with them. Getting, <coughs> getting them to attend school and take responsibility for their education and further is a part of our school and Qantas culture of success. What I would say is that uh, those are the sorts of things that we ought endorse and uh, encourage increasingly. And the work that uh, is being done by that foundation is truly inspirational. My journey uh, from coaching was a very unusual one in some ways, but it was clear. I played for 17 years in the national team. I, uh, I was playing four years before I got the job as national coach. Many people uh, thought that I didn't have a coaching uh, record before that, but indeed from the time I was 17 years old until during those 23 years before I became national coach, I coached state junior teams, club teams, junior teams, my daughter's team, a whole range of different teams at different levels. I had a degree in medicine, of course, which uh, provided me with an understanding of ph physiology, psychology, sports medicine, and uh, teamwork. I don't know how many of you people have ever been in an operating theatre and been awake. Anyone put, put their hand up? But this is an example of a whole range of people with different skills working under pressure to produce the right outcome. So I learned a lot about teamwork from my time in medicine. I spent a decade in the parliament. I didn't learn much about teamwork from my time there. <laughs> there is a place for it. And if you were to buy a copy of my very good book, which just happens to be on sale out the back, then uh, then you could read about that. But indeed, I spent my time um, in the parliament, of course, on my feet speaking uh, every day. And that, of course, was also a very good training for the life as a coach. I tried to be the coach that I would have liked to have had. I tried to take something from all of the coaches that, uh, that I'd had during my time. And indeed, I, uh, I understood that you needed to be a motivator, you needed to be a technician, you needed to be a technician, but more important than anything else, you needed to be a team builder. 
And, you, and I understood, I think, because I was a recent athlete, that uh, the players have to own uh, all of the important decisions and judgments in the game, not the coach. They had to own the tactics and the way we went about doing things. And so right from the very beginning, I worked on that. Now, I, unfortunately, I don't have a screen, so I can't see this. And it's not what I thought it might be. <coughs> Um, it's there, sorry. Um, and this is, uh, this is uh, Tolstoy. Tolstoy, of course, uh, is 100, 100 years past, but uh, the wisdom, I think, uh, means something to us today. This is a little piece from War and Peace. And in War and Peace, Andre is speaking to uh, some of the other soldiers. Prince Andre is speaking to some of the other soldiers before the Battle of Bordolino. And indeed, he's, uh, they're talking about chess. And the soldier says, well, it's like a chess game tomorrow. The, the pieces will be moved on the board and uh, the outcome will be decided according to the movements by those in higher quarters. And of course, uh, the disbelieving Andre says, no, that's not actually what happens. Because in chess, you've got any amount of time to make a decision. And in chess, a pawn is always less than two pawns and a king is, is more powerful than a pawn and uh, um, a queen is the most powerful person on the board, etc., etc. You understand that. But in war, sometimes a battalion or a regiment or whatever it might be, uh, a company has different force according to the quality of those in it. And sport is like that. And the essential message here is that uh, it's what's in each athlete that determines the result of the outcome or what will happen in the next competition. I was very lucky as a coach because I had a group of outstanding athletes that I inherited. They were used to hard work. They'd been drilled in technique, some of the techniques I wanted to shift and change, but they were used to it. They were diverse, they came from every part of the country, and they were ambitious. And when you have a group of athletes like that, you can do marvellous things. I understood how I wanted the team to play. I wanted them to be assertive. I thought we needed to develop multi-skilled players. We wanted players who could defend and attack. You were no longer a right or a left-sided player. We wanted people to have uh, uh, a range of skills that allowed them to do all of the things that were necessary. I wanted them to be open to tactical changes and I was hoping that uh, physically we could uh, stretch their capacity. And so I went into coaching, uh, if you like, with that perspective. And how, was we, how were we going to do it? How would we add value to these group of athletes? Well, coaching the national team isn't like the job that Alex Ferguson has. What does Alex Ferguson do when Alex has got a problem with his goalkeeper? He buys the guy from Spain, you know? You don't have that option open to you if you coach the national team. You've got to actually make the guy from Toowoomba better. And indeed, that's the real stuff of coaching. Likewise, I think, those that coach in the AFL understand very well that they have to make those that are on their list better. They can't have unlimited resources available to them. I got around me a bunch of good people. I got assistant coaches who would challenge me, people who I thought could add value to our group, and people who had new ideas and were open. We got together a range of people who could add value to the team in the areas of physiology. We paid attention to what was necessary with uh, those athletes that were going to be injured and indeed we embraced psychology. I don't know uh, that we do this yet well enough but it seems to me the area of human behaviour is one of the critical areas that we have to pay attention to when we're coaching. So my aim was to develop a group of athletes who had what I call reproducible skill under pressure. They could compete in every situation. 
And in my book, indeed, David, you would remember, there was a chapter called, uh, in my earlier book, there was a chapter called uh, uh, I uh, Flare, an overrated commodity. The original chapter was going to be called I Hate Flare. And many people said to me, well, what are you trying to do? You just want to produce automatons. My thesis was that what we thought was flare was actually superior practice skill. Sorts of things that we saw Peter Dacos do in an earlier time was superior practice skill. No one else was just doing them. Now, just about every football in the AFL can do those things. And so we went around and created an environment in which those things were practiced. We worked very hard at them. We always had contested drills. We were physically challenging the athletes at every training session. We no longer got them running on the running track. All of the training occurred with the ball and the stick on the field. First rule of, uh, of uh, training is uh, specificity. We trained them for what they had to do in the match. We paid attention to quality. We always wanted them to be flexible, pay attention to details. We allowed them to take risks when necessary. And hopefully, we were building resilience in them in that way. Now, it wasn't, in, it was about the time that this occurred that uh, Anders Ericsson wrote a paper on uh, what it took to be an expert. And Anders Ericsson wrote that paper, it was, it was first published in 1993. And indeed, the research was done on violinists. And I think I can go. there. I don't know whether you can see that. One of the most significant findings amongst the violinists that they were studying at the Berlin Conservatorium, one of the most significant findings was that most of the factors that the students identified as being important to improvement were also seen as being labour intensive and not much fun. The exceptions being sleeping and listening to music. Everyone from the very top students to the future music teachers, the future music teachers unfortunately were the ones who didn't make it at the top grade, <coughs> agreed on this. Improvement was hard and they didn't enjoy the work they did to improve. In short, no students who just love practice and thus needed less motivation to practice, these students were motivated to produce intensely and with full concentration because they saw such practice as essential to improve their performance. And if you look at the numbers below, the best of those students averaged 7,410 hours during their period of training. The better ones, the ones who finished in the middle of the group, 5,301 and the music teachers, 304, or 3,420. The difference in the quality of the students were produced by the conservatorium. All of them worked hard, but some of them worked much harder than others. And the thesis of Ericsson was, and remains, that this is what's required if you want real expertise. And the point that I think is important that is developed here is that it wasn't easy. It was difficult. You had to push yourself and there weren't those who had special motivation who necessarily made it. Now, I think that uh, we created an environment in which we were able to motivate the athletes to push themselves that way. We started to make some progress. We started to make progress uh, on what I would call the run, kick and catch stuff, and at the same time, we uh, developed a group of athletes who, uh, who were able to compete in a, in a competitive environment. And by the end of the first year, we won a tournament on penalties, the major tournament of the year. A year later, we won the World Cup. And what I found we also did that made a big difference was we decided that we were going to provide opportunity for players. Anybody who got selected in our squad got to play if they did the work. 
And that created an environment in which they understood that there would be opportunity. Because we provided opportunity and we embraced the change that had occurred in our game, which was the interchange, suddenly, well not suddenly, but over a period of two years, we had a huge cohort of players who'd all played 50 international. They all believed they were good enough. They were all training with one another and competing against one another for a spot. That was the hotspot of competition that we provided. At the same time that we were doing that, we paid attention to what was required off the field. For instance, when I started with the program, the players used to live in institutional accommodation. They had all their meals provided for them. Everything was looked after, it was all there. We decided that we would get them to live outside that environment. They had to make their own living arrangements, they had to look after their own eating arrangements, they had to look after their own lifestyle. Of course, when we brought young players into our program, we didn't necessarily do it that way. But what we did was we provided them with choice and we asked them, if you like, to grow up. We wanted them to become uh, mature athletes. And indeed, this quote, why grow up? Doing what you can to move your part of the world closer to the way it should be, while never losing sight of the way that it is, is what being a grown up comes to. And we asked our athletes to, uh, to make that step. My evolution occurred during that time and over a period of time I went from being what I thought was probably at the beginning quite a didactic coach to becoming one who was increasingly aware of the contribution the athletes had to make, the need for athlete participation and indeed by the time we got to the Sydney Olympics after eight years we had what I would have called an athlete driven program. I uh, changed during that time from being the didact to uh, uh, the collegial, to the mentor. And indeed, uh, we had some battles along the way. I, uh, I believed that uh, leadership was something for everybody in the team. And I was uh, not convinced uh, that the captaincy had, if you like, the aura that it, it, it uh, held the aura that some people thought it did. I had been a captain of the national team and I understood what was involved. But I believed if you wanted to have a successful team you needed a critical mass of leaders. And indeed, during that time, we developed a critical mass of leaders. It was a complex thing, it was difficult to do. There was lots of uh, opposition indeed in the media, in, uh, I was described as being a communist, um, Lenin-like, and I had his hairstyle, I understand, but I, uh, I thought that it was necessary for us to, in fact, um, change the way we thought about leadership. And indeed, uh, an article appeared in the Australian newspaper before the Sydney Olympics leading the leaderless team. And I uh, remember ringing up the journalists and saying, we don't have a leaderless team, we have a leader full team. It's interesting that all during the 90s, while we were having co-captains, leadership groups, working on developing leadership, the sorts of things that were important, um, there was a lot of uh, speculation about how silly this was. If you look at the sporting scene now, I think we're out throughout uh, this country and in other places, then uh, I would think what we were doing back then was, uh, is now the norm. And indeed, what I wanted was all of the people in my team to contribute. Some people in the team were terrific trainers and set an example for the group. Some of them did inspirational things on the field that changed the course of uh, events. Some of them were socially gregarious off the field and could provide for those uh, around them an environment which made them feel comfortable. Some people were willing to put up their hand and say, I disagree when we went in one particular direction. Some people were willing to put up their hand and say, I, I made a mistake, I got it wrong. All of those things were leadership and nobody exemplified all of those things. But if you asked of your team, everyone to make a contribution, you created an environment in which they felt like they could, then you found you had a force which was truly uh, outstanding. And I uh, move to this quote here, Maxine Cohn, who is uh, 
the global head of culture at Google. I saw this just recently. Our culture is employee driven and we have great expectations of our employees when it comes to culture. We want everyone to think and act like owners of the company and to take responsibility for making it what we want it to be. <clears throat> Indeed, uh, I think that uh, what Maxine's saying there exemplifies the sort of thing that we were trying to do with our team. Now, <clears throat> I think that uh, from there, where do you go? We had uh, developed a group. They were uh, generally uh, making progress. After eight, eight years with the Hockey Roos, the team was uh, greatly successful. I took over, eight years later, the Kookaburras. It was, a, it was a vastly different environment. And what I would say about the culture uh, that uh, I then came to uh, is interesting. You didn't have access to the Kookaburras in the same way you did to the Hockey Roos. Our players played in Europe, they played in India, they were global citizens, and indeed uh, they had a range of different masters. The hard, uh, I think the hardest thing uh, to do um, was to find a way in which those athletes could uh, perform at their best. And indeed, uh, it was harder to coach the men than the women. Perhaps the principal reason for that was I think the men didn't, uh, aren't as good team players as the women. I know that might not be uh, something that people like to hear, but uh, perhaps it's because women are uh, socialised to look after the family and to care for others. But indeed, it was difficult. So we spent a lot of time on uh, developing leadership there. Tactically, uh, the men were more intuitively uh, smart, and so uh, we needed perhaps less to spend less time on that. Given all of those things, I spent six years with the Kookaburras, and it's probably interesting for people to understand, although the Kookaburras aren't seen as being as successful as the Hockey Roos during uh, my time, they have a better winning record. The Kookaburras were more successful. The black spot on our CV, the bit that everybody remembers, is our failure at the London Olympics in the semi-final against Germany. And uh, indeed, as I outline in my book, I spent quite some time mulling over what went wrong, chastising myself for the mistakes that I made and indeed uh, trying wherever possible to uh, rectify that. We spent two years after the London Olympics trying to overcome what had uh, befallen us there. And essentially, um, while there's all sorts of things that can go wrong in a game, and one game uh, in, a, in, a, in a career of a couple of hundred games coaching might not seem uh, critical, that one game uh, we let ourselves down in was uh, pretty crucial. And the reason that I think we failed that day more than anything else was we didn't have the connectedness that we needed. I suppose because of that, it's now my view that perhaps in a team sport, the greatest competitive advantage that you can have for your team is the connectedness of your individuals, their capacity to engage, to own what's there, to be able to uh, work with one another, criticise one another, to be able to understand one another and to know what's going on. It's a difficult thing to put your finger on, but it's important. And I come to uh, this famous photo, and uh, I can almost remember what Zinedine was saying, but again, as I said, I can't see it on the screen. But it's uh, an indictment of uh, men of his team, of Real Madrid, in 2006, I think it is, the team finished 27 points off the top of the league in Spain. And uh, he's saying that the athletes were unable to uh, 
talk to one another because they were afraid of upsetting one another. It's an important quote. It happens in families, it happens in sporting teams, it happens in businesses, it happens everywhere. And the need for candour in what you do is perhaps the most critical thing that you need as a coach. When it comes to uh, calling out the things that are happening in your team, then you have to have that capacity. In the particular game that we lost in London, some of the players made mistakes on the field, they made bad calls on one or two of our set players, and nobody called them out. And when I spoke to the athletes afterwards, we were afraid of upsetting one another. This same thing came in. If you look at that football team that Zinedine Zidane was part of that played so badly in that year, there were no strong personalities in the dressing room. Had they had strong personalities in the dressing room, then they would have taken one another on in a way in which you need to do. You need to be able to confront if you're going to be outstanding. So I think candour is absolutely critical if we're going to be successful. Now, I don't believe that uh, there's anything else that ought to be taken out of this lecture, perhaps, than this. Excellence is difficult. It's one of the most enduring and deep-seated of all the beliefs about human nature that natural talent plays a major role in determining ability. This belief holds that some people are born with natural endowments that make it easier for them <coughs> to become outstanding athletes or musicians or chess players or writers or mathematicians or whatever. While they need a certain amount of practice to develop their skills, they need less than others who are not as talented and they ultimately reach much greater heights. Ericsson says this, my studies of experts point to a quite different explanation of why some people ultimately develop greater abilities than others, with deliberate practice playing a starring role. The thesis of Ericsson is that it is that thesis of deliberate practice. You have to do a lot of repetition. You have to keep, you have to get feedback. You have to get advice. You have to then try and do things that are more difficult and you have to keep doing them and you have to do them for a number of hours. Ericsson's research back in uh, the time gained popularity more recently when it was, uh, when uh, Malcolm Gladwell wrote his book Outliers and he talked about 10,000 hours. Indeed, as uh, was outlined in the earlier slide, it wasn't 10,000 hours of uh, of work required, that was just a convenient, if you like, appropriate, easy to remember number. What it does outline though, is that there is a great deal of difficult hard work required if you want to be outstanding. If you want to be outstanding, then you have to put in that time and you have to spend that time. The work is hard there's uncertainty and there's discomfort. But being excellent is a way of being. It's not just, uh, it's not just an achievement. In 2013, I was invited to Lord's Cricket Ground to speak at a seminar on staying at the top. And I was invited by England sport to be there. They'd just done very well at the Olympic Games in London. They wanted to sustain their success. And a whole range of people were speaking from different sports about the sorts of things that were necessary to sustain success. And indeed, my contribution uh, was early in the day and late in the day I was sitting there with the coach of the England cricket team. And the coach of the England cricket team at the time was a guy called Andy Flower. And Andy Flower, in a moment of real candour, sitting at the end of the table, said, I've been the coach of the team now for four years. When I became the coach, our aim was to become number one in the world in one-day cricket and five-day cricket. 
and uh, we've just beaten the Australians in the Ashes series and we're number one in one day cricket and we're number one in five day cricket now. And in three months time we're going out to Australia to play against Australia in another Ashes series. These things may become a thing of the past, mind you, Ashes series. <laughs> and um, he said, and I'm very worried because I think our team's lost focus. They were all set on being number one and uh, we've got there and now what? And I'm very worried about what's going to happen. Anybody got any advice here? And I thought I knew the answer, but being a very good Australian, I sat on my hands and didn't say anything. <laughs> I went to the betting shop. <laughs> I shouldn't have said that now, that'll be controversial, but I, uh, I, um, a few people made a contribution, uh, but Andy Flower could see what was coming, but it wasn't much that he seemed that could do about it. And I think everyone who's a coach here has seen this happen with their team. They went out to Australia in three months and they played Nash's series and lost 5-0 and Andy Flower got sacked a few months later. Because being excellent is about everybody in the team individually wanting to be the best they can be. It's not about where your position is in the rankings. It's about everyone. It's about deep personal change of the individuals in your group. It's about providing an environment in which that can occur. And it's about each individual wanting to be the best team player that they can possibly be. We have an issue in society, uh, and sport can play a part. I hope it can make a difference. But we have this environment in which everyone gets positive reinforcement. Every kid gets a prize just for turning up. Just for turning up. This is supposed to send the message that, well, you know, you can achieve anything you want to, but it actually sends the message that turning up's enough, or you can get it without the hard work, without doing anything special. We have an environment in which celebrity, looking good, is, uh, is uh, really important. Everybody here knows who Megan Gale is, but I bet you not so many people know Brian Schmidt. The UFC says that Ronda Rousey is the most outstanding athlete on the planet. She won a bronze medal at the Olympics in judo. She's a UFC fighter. But how many people who you here know who Ashton Eaton is? Ashton Eaton has won the decathlon at the last two Olympic Games. He's the best athlete on the planet. Media and marketing is seen as, uh, is, as success. You know, the product doesn't necessarily have to be that good. That's a problem too. I suppose I want to finish by saying that, that uh, we need to uh, challenge some of those things. I was uh, roundly criticised uh, about uh, a year ago now when I made some offhand comment while I was in Cairns to the ABC about the fact that our girls who won the Rugby Sevens had won a soft medal. Because I believe, and I've had a fair bit of Olympic experience, that not every medal at the Olympics is the same. Now, I wasn't being critical of the girls whose performance, given the milieu in which they competed, was terrific. But the point I was making is that we need to be objective about what we're looking at. And I said, Here's an event at the Olympics in which the first four teams all came from the Commonwealth. That's never, that didn't occur in any other event in the Rio Olympics, only in that event. So this is a Commonwealth sport. <clears throat> I said you should do a thought exercise here. In what sport? In hockey, in basketball, in soccer, in water polo, in handball, in volleyball, can you put together a team in a year and a half and win a gold medal. Can you in any of those sports? The answer is clearly no, you can't. Indeed, we actually tried the Sydney Olympics. We put together a handball team. We got elite netballers, a whole bunch of athletes, put them together and made ourselves a handball team for the Sydney Olympics. Where did we come? Stone cold motherless last. If you look at the performance of the Opals 
Well, the Matildas at the Rio Games, you'd have to say they did very well. They didn't win a medal, either of them. But their performance was very good. Japan, for instance, in women's soccer, who were played in the last two World Cup finals, didn't even qualify for the Olympics. Didn't even get through the qualification. The Opals, indeed, did qualify. And in order to qualify, they had to beat New Zealand. They didn't play New Zealand in the final. The point I would make is that what are we looking at here what we're looking at needs to be considered. Finally, I want to just paraphrase, if, if you like, Roger Bannister. We all know who Roger Bannister was. He ran the first four-minute mile. But he said, and I remember reading this a long, long time ago, the serious driver for le excellence in sport reaches a situation that's too big for them to master. In ordinary life, we can dodge that. We play hide and seek with reality. We avoid looking at ourselves. We, we can skip things. But in sport, you can't. There's a pattern of success and failure which can be confusing and difficult. But that leads to a self-discovery of our limitations and our abilities. You learn, for instance, in sport, the difference between being tired and exhausted. Athletes learn that being tired is just on the way to getting to exhaustion. They have to push themselves that much further. And indeed, you learn that you can't do it all alone. You learn that you have to cooperate. And perhaps the greatest uh, message that I think that uh, I can give you today is that cooperation is critical. It is the thing that holds your team or group together. It's the thing that holds our society together. It's the thing that occurs every weekend throughout this country on sporting fields all over the place. People get together, it binds our community in a way in which few other things do. And therefore it's something that we should cherish and central to us wanting to be able to be involved in this is a search for excellence, search for perhaps abilities and skills that we didn't think we had. I coached the national teams in my sport for 14 years and I never met an athlete yet who knew how good they could be. I never met one. And my job as the coach was to extend and stretch them, to take them to places where perhaps they didn't think they could. And if, uh, if you did that successfully, then along the way, you found yourself able to build an outstanding team. I thank you for the opportunity to be here. Uh, I'm sorry about uh, not having the technology as good as I should. Uh, and I hope that uh, it's been of interest. Thank you. Rick, I, did, I didn't have the um, clock running on that, but if you went for 45 minutes, I feel like we could have gone for another 45 and people would have just kept sat there and lapped it up. It was truly fantastic. Um, Certainly in our deliberations about a rate for this event each year, we remind ourselves that it's July in Melbourne and it's football mad uh, place that we live in and um, sort of venturing outside of the football arena, we kind of knew we had to come up with someone pretty special and I think we, um, we can all attest to having done that tonight. And I think we all leave here this evening with a deep appreciation of why the name Rick Charlesworth holds such a, re a revered place on and beyond the Australian sporting landscape. Um, from your platform as national coach of the Australian Olympic men's and women's hockey teams, it's no surprise that um, Rick's philosophies and strategies have been the focus of so much attention. Propelled by his willingness to name, frame and share his coaching ideas, Rick Charlesworth has ascended to the status of the coach's coach. In the pursuit of excellence and the quest for success, coaches from all sports have been attracted to Rick's ideas and insights. Of course, it's not only sport where the winning edge is sought, so it's no great surprise that Rick's work has permeated business and the political sphere. Your thinking your leadership, about leadership and culture and your coaching through your coaching and writing have provided a framework for pursuing excellence that many others have sought to adopt and follow. As you say, there is no shortcut to excellence. It is no surprise that the prominent companies regularly employ you to speak about high performance and team building. We have learned from Rick Charlesworth tonight that 
the effect that for effective leadership is not about one person, but it needs a collective effort. His pioneer work in distributive leadership through the formation of leadership groups has now become commonplace in all sports teams. But for Rick, as we have come to better understand, what makes teams and groups effective is their shared commitment to excellence. He is not an advocate of popularist leadership and doesn't shy away from driving high standards and demands associated with the relentless pursuit of excellence. In this pursuit, he acknowledges there are sure to be casualties along the way, but for those who make to opt into the journey, the rewards can be magnificent. Of course, there is much about Rick Charlesworth that we didn't hear much about tonight in the limited time available. He didn't talk much about his family life and his five very impressive children, or his work in driving cardiovascular research funding for the Harry Perkins Institute of Medical Research in Perth. Indeed, Rick's insatiable appetite for growing and developing was well captured in a re recent interview where he lamented how much more he could achieve and get involved in if he didn't have to sleep. Rick, it's been a privilege to listen to you tonight and to be part of a very eclectic journey that you have taken us on. On behalf of Deakin University and everyone here tonight, I'd like to present you with this gift as a, to a token of our appreciation for the, for the generosity of delivering tonight's oration. It has been an honour and a privilege to listen to you tonight and gain a full appreciation of the positive impact that you have had on the Australian sporting landscape. I invite you all to join me once again in thanking Dr. Rick Charlesworth, AO, for delivering the 2017 David Parker narration. <laughs> I'd like to close by acknowledging the contribution of the wonderful events team and media team here at Deakin and thank you for your energy and attention to detail. But most of all, on behalf of Deakin University, I want to thank you all for your attendance here tonight. I trust that you have enjoyed the evening and look forward to seeing you at the 2018 David Park Narration for Sport and Social Change. With so many unemployed cricketers floating around, who knows what we might have in store for you next year at the David Park Narration. As, we, as um, Rick told you, their books are available in the foyer. Thank you and a very good night.